Interrupt me whenever you want, whenever you feel something is not clear. Uh, we can make it as interactive as, as possible. Um, so I'm going to talk about NiPipe and analyzing brain imaging data. And I'm sure many of you are curious about what's going on inside heads of other people. Maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your spouse. Well, I'm curious what's inside of my head when I'm trying to make lame jokes. Um, so the problem with figuring that out is uh, it's how to keep the specimen intact when you try to uh, peek into what's going on inside the head. Um, so basically in vivo, or in other words, keeping the subject alive uh, uh, imaging. And we have these wonderful machines for uh, over 30 years now, um, which are called the magnetic resonance scanners. And um, they work using quantum physics uh, um, to uh, peek inside uh, a tissue. It was originally developed for looking into material design and uh, uh, faults in different structures and metals. Uh, but then it was adopted to have uh, higher spatial accuracy and literally produce images like this that without slicing any brains allows you to see how a particular part of our body looks like. And we're gonna focus on the human brain. Um, and in brain imaging, there are multiple different data types. Um, and the most common one is focus on structure. And this is what you see here. And this is a structural uh, MRI scan, also called uh, T1 weighted scan. Uh, and it shows you different folds of the brain. Uh, you can infer actually the surface of the folding of the brain from it. And you can divide it into different subregions. Uh, you can try to look at uh, features such as the thickness of the cortex, uh, because the, the brain cells, the neurons, uh, they have their cell bodies on the outside of the brain and connects through axons uh, through the inside of the brain. So the layer outside of the brain is where the cell bodies are, and that layer can have different thickness in different people, um, and that could be an indication on certain diseases or uh, capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. This is one type of data that we're dealing with. Uh, another one is uh, functional MRI. So the previous thing was fairly static, was very slow. Like we have a brain and maybe your, uh, the, the cortical folding or actually cortical thickness will change from now till when you're gonna be older by 10 years or maybe when you're gonna learn a very intense skill. But it's a very slow process. Changes that we see there are very, very slow. But we can use a different type of scan um, uh, that is susceptible to blood flow. And this is another fascinating story when a lot of different things had to come together for this to actually uh, happen. Uh, basically, um, someone figured out that oxygenated and deoxygenated uh, blood have different magnetic properties. And using magnetic resonance, we can pick on that. And that wouldn't be enough uh, if it wasn't for the wonderful uh, vascular system of our brains, uh, which actually has a built-in optimization in it. So basically, if I am using one part of the brain and it has higher um, uh, power consumption, so it requires more metabolites to recover, uh, there is an increased blood flow, but not to everywhere, but only to the part that actually requires more energy. Um, and because of that, combined with the fact that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties, we are actually able to localize uh, which parts of the brain are active during particular tasks. So we put people in the scanner and we tell them to do a thing, and then we contrast that thing with doing a different thing. Uh, and this way we can figure out which part of the brain was more involved uh, between block A and block B. Simplest thing, I can put a subject into the scanner, ask the person to tap their finger for, let's say, 20 seconds, and then do nothing for 20 seconds, tap their finger, don't tap their finger, and contrast those two, and I will see the motor cortex, which is responsible for our movements, um, consuming more energy through the proxy of uh, the blood flow. Um, and this requires us to acquire many different images of the brain, one after another, in a sequence. That's not all. We also have something called diffusion MRI. 
Um, and this type of data allows us to look at the structure of the connections of the brain. So remember when I talked about the, the cortical folding, the layer outside, uh, and the connections going through the brain? Those are the connections. Those are the accents. And another fascinating physical phenomenon that allows us to do that um, is that we can um, have a specific scan with a specific directionality um, that probes uh, Brownian movement of water molecules uh, in a particular one direction. So Brownian movement is basically um, atoms moving around uh, when they are not in absolute zero. Um, so whatever that, for example, glass of water, gentleman is pouring there, uh, molecules inside that glass of water will uh, move around by themselves. But if you put them into a straw, that straw will restrict the movement in one axis, but not the other axis. And axons, uh, because of their fatty um, uh, coils around them, basically look like straws. So if you can figure out which direction the movement is restricted to, we can figure out where the accents are. And this is what diffusion imaging does. And we can get those beautiful images out of this, showing us where those tubes or basically bundles consisting of many, many different accents are and which parts of the brain they, uh, they connect. And again, here we have to acquire many different images of the brain uh, to probe different directions at the same time. Okay. So as you can see, there's plethora of different data that we can get out of the human brain uh, to use for studying healthy as well as diseased uh, populations, predict uh, outcomes or, uh, or try to understand how the healthy brain works. But we're here to talk about data. Uh, and the beautiful thing about scanners is that they have a fairly standardized ways of outputting data. And most of it is in DICOM, which is a medical form uh, quite rich in metadata, but unfortunately the standardization is, is not as great because different manufacturers uh, will add or remove certain bits. There's also the nifty file format, uh, which is more, more, more used in the academic uh, community. But what you really have to know about this data is that it's basically a three-dimensional cube, a three-dimensional NumPy array, basically, uh, to speak the, the Python language. Um, and sometimes there's a fourth dimension when you have multiple stacks of the same volume, as I mentioned with the functional scans or the diffusion scans. But what do we want to do with this data? What, where is the challenge? What kind of things we can do and want to do with this? First of all, we need to do some cleaning. Um, the scanner doesn't give, uh, give us uh, images that are uh, perfectly clean, and there are some deformations. For example, here we have a deformation and the uh, orbitofrontal areas, which is caused by the fact that there is air in the sinuses, um, which changes the magnetic field, which causes this distortion. This brain doesn't look, we don't have horns in our brains like on the image on the left, uh, but because of that air, there's a distortion. And because of individual differences, the amount of air will be different and different person, people will have different distortions. But we have ways for correcting that using extra data and particular algorithms. There's also motion correction. Uh, people move in the scanner um, uh, because, well, we cannot stay still all the time. And even those micro movements, I'm talking about a millimeter movement, basically a slight rotation, uh, can cause uh, spurious results. So we also want to correct for that. And we also have methods for that. Basically, we can do spatial co-registration of individual volumes and in time. Uh, and then there's also physiological noise. Um, I started my career doing um, uh, neurosurgeries or helping doing neurosurgeries. I'm not a real doctor. Uh, so if anyone needs help, don't look at me. Um, so, and the thing that struck me the most is when you open the skull, um, you can see the brain pulsating. And why is that? Because, it, because of the blood flow. Uh, so there is a physical movement caused by, uh, by how blood flow uh, influences the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. And that movement um, and those confounds can also disrupt our results. So we can also deal with that through various uh, denoising uh, methods. But denoising is not all. We also want to do some kind of a normalization. We, 
rarely study a single individual person. We want to wanna make uh, our conclusions based on groups. We want to generalize to other people. So we need to acquire data from many different subjects. And then the question is, how do we put all of those results in the same space? Um, and, and here the problem is basically of taking all of those brains, which are um, obtained, the, the scans were obtained in different orientations, uh, and putting them into basically the same space. Um, and the other problem is that people are, people brains are different. They have different foldings, and we want to not only rotate them and maybe change their sizes, scale them, but also do some nonlinear a transformation to those brains to make them look similar, to be able to localize changes uh, more accurately. And finally, there is feature extraction. When we get our brains noised and we got them normalized into the same space, now we want to figure out um, what uh, kind of features we want to extract from. We want to get a signal. We talked about cortical thickness. That's one of the signals we can extract, basically asking how the thickness of the cortex changes with regards to whatever we are studying, for example, between people uh, who are experiencing or suffering from Parkinson's and normal controls. Um, uh, but there are many, many other features that we can also extract. We can talk about connectivity. I've talked a little bit about uh, diffusion scanning and tracing accents in the brain, and that will be structural connectivity. But you can also look at this in the more kind of information theory point of view when you have time courses in different parts of the brain and you would uh, look at how similar they are um, and basically try to infer whether there's shared information between parts of the brain based on their temporal uh, information. Um, and that would uh, be a hint that there is something ongoing between them and that could be uh, basically a connection. Uh, and then, uh, finally, they could be also task-related bold signals. So when I mentioned that finger tapping and we were contrasting people finger tapping versus the same people not finger tapping, uh, this is basically nothing else than fitting a very simple GLM model uh, to the time series in every single part of the brain independently and trying to figure out which parts of, those, of the brain are tracking our design. And here our design is very simple either I move the finger or not. And that gives us localization. And there are many, many, many other features that people try to uh, extract from the brain. So why am I talking about all this? Uh, where is the Python? Where is the data? Um, um, and basically, all of this has been done, uh, or has, people have been researching these different methods and dealing with MRI for over uh, 25 years now. And there has been tons of different software written for it, um, but uh, it has been written mostly in academic environment. So um, I don't know who's, who's here has been working with, with software written uh, by scientists. Right. So unless, unless those are the, the, the software carpentry trained scientists, uh, <laughs> You can expect a certain uh, flavor. Yes, thank you, thank you. A certain flavor. There's some diversity. Uh, it's quite heterogeneous. This is this is the best illustration that we came up with. Uh, it's basically explosion of color. And uh, let me give you some examples of that. Uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, toolboxes that that we are uh, using in the field. It's the most popular way of analyzing uh, functional MRI. It's uh, right now, I don't know, 15 years old or something like that. Uh, and it's written in MATLAB, um, which is great, uh, of course. And, um, and it has this user interface, which is this MATLAB-ish uh, UI. It allows you to do scripting by writing M files that basically write a sort of a batch code when you send jobs and tell what, what the input arguments are, et cetera, et cetera. This piece of sauce was written by the most cited neuroscientists in history, um, among and many other people. And there's a lot of expertise in it. Well, let's give you another example. So this is a, a command line uh, for one of the best co-registration methods in the field. And as you can see, it's very um, flavorful. Was that the? <laughs> Sorry. Spicy, spicy. Yeah. Very dense. 
So, so what, what would be the best uh, thing to do? Is just port everything to Python, right? 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 No. 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 So, well, it's all about the money, isn't it? So basically, writing complex code is expensive. So if we were to take all these methods and rewrite them into Python and actually keep doing that while researchers come up with new methods, that would be an incredibly tall order and that would be very, very expensive. But that's not all. Uh, testing complex code is even harder. So we're talking about methods with our cutting edge um, research practices and people are arguing what is the best way of validating these things. There are really hard questions about what is really the ground truth in many of these methods. Writing unit tests for this is a nightmare. Um, and many of the pieces of software that we are using uh, maintain their quality by having a big user base. So basically, in other words, we have many, many researchers using that software when they see something funky because they do inspect the results, they bring it up and they basically are an army of testers, um, which is also very expensive to replicate. Um, so what are we gonna do? So NiPipe to the rescue. Uh, so NiPipe is nothing else than a framework that tries to unify the way you access all of these tools. So instead of reinventing the wheel, we're trying to make it easier for you to take those tools as building blocks and build your apps, build your platforms, uh, as well as in our case, build workflows. So what we wanna do, we wanna do this big data processing thing when you do the denoising and then you do the normalization and then you do feature extraction and connect this into that big workflow and you wanna pick and choose from different packages, different uh, sources of software written maybe in MATLAB, maybe written in Python, maybe written in C and compiled, but I want to be able to combine all of them in one framework. So this is what NiPipe does. Uh, and at its core, in NiPipe, um, you have the concept of an interface. An interface is nothing else than a Python wrapper uh, around a particular piece of software. So this is an interface for something that is a scary name, brain extraction tool. Uh, it doesn't actually physically extract any brains from any, so no people were harmed in writing this software. Um, it basically uh, tries to, from the image, remove the skull and remove everything that is not the brain, which helps later on with uh, car registration. Um, and here I will just declare this uh, as an uh, instance of an object. I'll fill in the inputs and I just uh, call the run method. And this one is a command line tool uh, written in C. Um, and I can do the same for a different interface. Um, and this one does realignment, which is basically motion correction. So you have many, many different volumes and you wanna correct them so they would all be aligned together. Um, as you can see, it's the same scheme. Um, instance of an object, set inputs, and then call run. But under the hood, what NiPy will do, will cre create this incredibly flavorful M file um, and, and run MATLAB, or actually compiled version of MATLAB, if that is available, so you wouldn't have to have a license. Um, and at the end, you don't have to deal with all of this because what you are dealing with is, is, is this likable uh, Pythonic code. Um, and the reason why this whole idea, because we've been running NiPipe for a few years now, um, is so successful is that we try to make writing those wrappers very, very simple. Um, so to write a wrapper, you have to define uh, uh, three classes. You have to define the inputs, uh, the outputs, and the, the core meat of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of, your, of your wrapper. Um, so to streamline this process, we are heavily based on object-oriented programming. So we inherit a lot of things. So you don't have to repeat your code over and over again. So for example, here, this is a command line interface. So you're gonna inherit a lot from a command line class, which will do the command line things for you. There's a separate one for MATLAB, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, And the other thing we're using are traits. Who knows traits? 
traits. OK, types. Typing, strong typing. OK, Python typing, no. Yes? So, um, so traits actually brings back typing to, uh, to Python. Uh, and that is helpful. And this is ba those are basically the, the traits objects. That is helpful because now we can validate the inputs that people provide to the interfaces before we even run them. So that's an extra layer of, um, of error checking. So for example, if you expect a file and you give us a number, we're like, dude, what's wrong? And, and then we're not gonna even run it. Um, okay, so, and the other thing is that, for example, here is a command line uh, interface. So to translate this particular input to uh, part of the command line, the string that you actually want to execute, um, we're going to use this uh, arg string, which is nothing else than like uh, Python or C style string replacement, I think. And this could have flags, this could be a positional argument, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got it all covered. Uh, and then this is the main uh, uh, meat of the, um, of the interface. As you can see, there's a, a command line. Uh, inheritance, you set up the inputs, you tell which, uh, which actual command is it, and this will be di a little bit different for MATLAB things, a little bit different for purely Pythonic things. So because it is so easy to write those interfaces, our community grew very fast and is very, very vibrant right now. And by being allowing people to make small but meaningful contributions to your projects that does, do not require learning a large chunk of the code base, uh, you are attracting more and more contributors. So we have plenty of new PRs coming uh, from places I never heard of. Uh, and right now we have over 100 contributors, which uh, makes me very, very happy for a relatively niche project uh, when you think about it. Um, and I believe, this is not scientifically tested, obviously, but I believe this is because making those small contributions is so easy. A lot of those PRs are not major refactorings or adding major new features. Those are basically new interfaces or correction for old interfaces. Um, so if you can inject that into your projects, you can benefit greatly. Uh, okay. So we have the interfaces, but okay, right, so what? Like we have those uh, unified ways of calling things, what you can do with this? Well, you can start uh, using them directly to build your apps, tools, platforms, uh, or you can actually build workflows. Uh, and workflows is what we are more interested in. And here's a disclaimer, I am fully aware there are many different workflow engines out there, and some of them are brilliant and great, uh, and this is, Yet another one. Um, we've been working on it for a while, and I personally would like to switch to something else. I would have to maintain all this code. Um, but there are some features that are unique to ours that people got used to, uh, and it's hard to replicate uh, somewhere else. Nonetheless, let me explain what it does. Um, so basically, it has uh, some standard features, such as caching, for example. If I run a workflow, and then I try to run it again, uh, it will just uh, bring the outputs from cache. Uh, if I change something in the middle of the workflow, uh, for example, one of the inputs, um, and I try to run it again, it will bring everything up to that point from the cache and only rerun the things that are necessary to be rerun. Uh, we can also iterate over parameters, which we're gonna show in a bit. Um, we can have sub workflows, and because of fun out and fun in back, uh, basically in a branching pattern. So the concept of a map node, a lot of these tools, uh, they operate on a single file, but you wanna run it on a list of files. We have that covered, we basically uh, switch something from a node to a map node, which is a standard map reduce thing. You map, you run everything uh, on individual files, and then you reduce it to a list of results. Um, we also have iterables. Commonly in this kind of scenarios, you want to iterate over a set of parameters you have some kind of denoising uh, scheme. For example, uh, we, there's the, the AR models are commonly used here as well uh, for temporal denoising, and you wanna check some parameters, you wanna iterate over them, but you wanna see the, the, for example, the output at the very end, how does it relate to these changes in the very beginning. So this is how you can do it easily when you basically uh, specify 
what input you want to iterate over and what are the variables uh, you want to use for the iteration. And that will split the workflow into um, subtrees. Um, you can also join them together at the very end. Um, if you want to merge something into a group level analysis on something like that. So you have all these nice features. Um, and the other thing that is also quite interesting is that we support execution on different systems, um, different schedulers and high performance computers. Um, and basically this is very easy. It's nothing else than doing workflow.run and specifying which plugin uh, you want to use uh, depending on what scheduler is used in your cluster. Uh, or you can run it locally on a multi-processor computer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I presume, and some of you, um, you might be wondering, high-performance computers, clusters, like what about I thought HPCs are dead? Dude, are you from the past? Uh, but what about the infinite cloud? And what's the meaning of life? Um, so, um, so yes, uh, that might be surprising to, to, to some people, especially coming to the field um, from outside, not through academia. Uh, but high performance computers or supercomputers or clusters, are basically multi-tenant system for, uh, for doing processing, are very common in academia. Uh, still, and I don't think that's going to change. And let me explain why. Um, it's because they are still cheaper. If you can keep uh, your farm of computers, your owned hardware, uh, busy at all times, it is still cheaper than renting stuff from Amazon, uh, especially if that system could be shared across users. So that's why it is a multi-tenant system. Uh, so many of these high-performance computers do not give you root access on your virtual machine, you basically are your user and you're sharing nodes with other users and there's fair use policies, there are priorities, there are queues, etc., etc. But within this, uh, within those constraints, this is still cheaper. Nonetheless, you can still uh, always spin your own cluster uh, in the cloud. Uh, so basically rent your own cluster from Amazon or Google or, or something else. And there's a, a nifty piece of software called Star Cluster that allows you to do that uh, quite easily. Uh, and on top of that, Nightpipe also supports AWS S3, so you can always pull and push uh, to S3 if you uh, wish to do that. Well, that'll be all from me. Uh, I hope that uh, with this little introduction I uh, explain a little bit about the, the different types of data we're dealing in neuroimaging uh, and showed you that Nightpipe is a useful tool for um, creating your own um, data processing services uh, or medical apps, uh, but also good for uh, writing your own workflows and pipelines. If you want to learn go more, uh, go to nightpipe.org slash nightpipe. And I want to thank all of my collaborators as you probably noticed, there are no names in this presentation, uh, including mine, because this is not only my project. This is project of everyone who's contributing to it. Um, and this is a, a big community, and everyone uh, should be um, credited for the effort. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Excellent question. Let me repeat that for everyone who uh, hear it. Uh, the question was, well, we're using HPCs, but we're using all these different software. Aren't we dependent on the capability of individual packages to run in an HPC environment? So um, the answer to that is that most of the parallelization that gets you the furthest um, is, uh, is trivial, because you parallelize over subjects. You parallelize over completely independent tasks. And you can run basically processes that are completely independent in parallel. And they do not require support for MPI or any other sophisticated technologies. And that really gets you far. Um, it's true. Most of these pieces of software do not support technologies like MPI. Um, some of them uh, do support multi-threading. 
and you can take advantage of that when you basically you know send them to a beefy node and let it know that it has 16 CPUs to um, to use. But uh, as I said, we can get really far with just trivial parallelization over subjects or individual tasks. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, just for curiosity. So, uh, NiPipe now? NiPipe. NiPipe, NiPipe. yes. Uh, so it is mostly academic, but there are some companies that are using it uh, kind of uh, in the back uh, to provide uh, data processing as a service. Um, we don't, don't always hear much from them, <laughs> so it's hard to uh, kind of figure out how many companies actually do that. The, uh, the project is licensed with Apache 2 license, so you can literally do whatever you want with it. Um, and we're encouraging people from the industry to take advantage of this and hopefully maybe like give something back in terms of PRs and, and supplements. Yep. All right, so, uh, so this is a, a great question, and for I just hear containers in the air for some reason. Um, um, so basically, the question was, what about all the dependencies? You have to have the software installed, and that's a burden. What about like the obscure dependencies, like a MATLAB license server and things like that? Um, so for a long time. There was no good solution for this because virtual machines had an overhead, Docker containers had uh, ridiculous uh, uh, requirements in terms of kernel versions, and they're, they're unusable in HPCs. But this has very recently changed uh, with very lightweight containers that uh, do not do any user mapping, do not do any network uh, management, or strong sandboxing, they just deal with capturing dependencies. And those containers are called Singularity, and you can convert Docker to Singularity, and it all works. So we are uh, looking more and more into this technology, and we are, uh, it's fairly new. There are only a handful of clusters out there that use it, but that will be the solution, basically, uh, to capture all of these dependencies. It will not deal with the MATLAB license thing, but there's another workaround. It's called the MATLAB compiled version or MATLAB compiled runtime. Allows any uh, MATLAB programmer to take their thing, what they wrote, and compile it into a portable uh, product that they can send for anyone to run without a license. And this is how we are using a lot of uh, this software. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, great question. Um, and individual personal diagnostics require a lot of distributions, basically. So if we want to figure out how you personally, you know, your particular cortical folding, et cetera, et cetera, is predictive of many different things, we need to collect a lot of data uh, from other people. Uh, so uh, I think not enough of that is being done, and, and IPAC is not able to solve that problem because it's a data collection problem. We need to have this, those distributions. But there are projects out there that are doing a great job. For example, is the UK Biobank, um, who, which started uh, recently, and their goal is to scan um, um, a normal distribution of 100,000 people. Um, and the idea is that you scan 100,000 people now, and they are, they're actually targeting people that are slightly older, um, and then they follow up, and you know, 5% of them will develop dementia. Uh, and because they've got the, the time point in the past, they can uh, design predictive methods uh, to figure out um, who's going to get dementia in the future. But because it's such a big data set, 
you can get those distributions. For, for example, you can have a distribution specific for gender, specific age ranges, and other things, and you can use those specific distributions to take a new subject, a new patient, um, and, um, and figure out what is the best uh, way of treating that particular person, which uh, points to the precision medicine. But those co-registration methods are very important because you have to bring people together anyway, uh, because we have to interpret you in the context of a distribution which is specific to you, but it's still a distribution pulling from more people. Yes, so right, right now, yeah, right now a lot of this science is done with uh, kind of working assumptions that everyone knows is wrong, that all brains are the same, uh, uh, which is kind of a chicken and egg thing. We want, it's a regularization problem, in other words. We want to put brains in the roughly the same space, uh, but at the same time we don't want to remove the variance that we're actually looking at or we're looking for. Um, so it is a bit of a chicken and egg problem, uh, but, uh, but I believe the kind of individualized uh, distributions are on the rise and we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, and there are methods to create templates that are specific for your study or specific for your population. Um, and NIPAD does support uh, some of them. Hey. Oh, and don't believe in MRI light detectors. <laughs>